Now, Ryan Gable, who has not been on the show in a while, I think the last time that Ryan and I got together, we were talking about uh, we were talking about um, what Barbie and Ryan. What was the other one again? Oppenheimer. That's probably. right, Barbenheimer. That's the last. Th- that's the last time we got together. Well, anyway, Ryan Gable's an author. He's the host of the Secret Teachings radio show, frequent guest on Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis. I think he'll be on there later on tonight, and he's joining me this evening. It's great to be back with you, my friend. How you been? Yeah, you too. I've been pretty good. I've been having a lot of uh, my time the last couple of days consumed because of the Super Bowl stuff, of course, Oh yeah, uh, for diff- different reasons than maybe some people, but I've uh, been good. How about you? I've been all right. I have to imagine that you are not the type to buy uh, to buy any kind of you know Super Bowl uh, pool uh, squares or anything like that. You're not you're not you're not doing any of that. No, none of that. None of that. None of that. I mean, I, it's fun to fun to play around with it, but I don't do any of that. No. Nope. Well, I, I here's the thing I want to ask you about because I know that you're going to have a much larger, more in depth presentation later on this evening, uh, and you can definitely and I would love for you to plug that for people to go check out. But in the meantime. Um, I w- I want you to just jump right in, be it halftime show, the game itself, the commercials, anything that really strings together. What were the prevailing themes, the prevailing imagery that uh, you as somebody who has spent a lot of time uh, researching, uh, compiling uh, data, publishing it into books? This is the way that you study the world and you study how civilizations operate in a little bit more of an occult sense. So, uh, Go right ahead. I'm just going to leave the floor to you. What, what did we have cooking last night? Yeah, well, I do have an expertise in the occult. I've done radio for 14 years, professionally for about a decade, and I've been doing the Super Bowl analysis for about that long um, before it became popular and certainly before um, before it became uh, very trendy, not just popular. So when I was looking at uh, the Super Bowl last night, I actually noticed something that was kind of synchronistic or almost coincidental and that was i had put the game on before it was on about an hour before it was on to uh paramount was it paramount plus i think it was paramount plus and uh, i was having internet trouble and my my tv my internet froze so the screen froze on my tv and there was a cbs nfl logo and that logo looked different than the other logos that i had seen for the super bowl and i thought it's kind of weird they're they used a different font for the words Super Bowl. Hmm. I don't know if you got the uh, link I sent you. I sent you a little file. Do you have that to pull up? I'm going to check it out. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. Hold on a second. You sent this to me in email? Yes, that's correct. It was like a Word file, I believe, is the format. Hold on. The secret Just so the listeners can see exactly what I'm talking about. Where, where did you send it to me? Because I sent you the link. I didn't get anything back. Was that in an email or in a, in a text message? No, it was in an email. I can send it to you again very quickly. Yeah, here. Pl- please do, and I'll uh, I'll get that up on screen while you're while you're walking us through it. Yeah, yeah, sure. So they use you know just usually it's the same font, but for some reason that there was there were NFL CBS uh, logos slash promotions, and there was one a big banner in Las Vegas where they had the same font. Where for Super Bowl the E and the R in Super Bowl was changed. So it was like a different kind of font and the O in bowl was changed. So it was a different kind of font. And I just noticed that because my TV, my internet froze and this logo comes up, it's frozen. Like right when the camera's zooming out to go to break and it was just frozen there. And I, so I was like, what? that's very peculiar. So I just jotted it down on a piece of paper because that was like, I love symbols. I mean, every letter is a symbol. It doesn't have to be a conspiracy. It's just a symbol. So I I wrote them down because I thought I'd never seen something like that's weird. And then when the game was over, where they gave the Lombardi trophy out, there's this, you know, the big purple banner around the stage where they gave the trophy out. And the word champions also had the same O from bowl from CBS and the NFL, which had a line through it. Your listeners will see this in just a moment. And the, letter C in champions also had a line through it. Now you could say, well, that's just, maybe there's some random font that just puts lines through C's and O's. I I don't know. But when I looked up what those symbols were, I I knew what the circle with the line through it was. It's, it's phi, P H I it's Greek. It's a Greek letter. And it actually means phallus. And that's not an opinion. That's literally what it correlates to. 
um, but it also represents fertility because it's a it's a vertical bar going into a circle. Hmm. A vertical bar going into a circle is, of course, penis going into you know what? It's the it's the phallus and the yon and the yonic symbol, or the yab yum, or the yin and yang. So it's a fertility symbol, and that's what the circle. It's phi. It now in Greek and in math, it's known as the golden ratio, and the golden ratio is the unfolding of perfection, the unfolding of the divine plan. The numerological, you know, the, the power of numbers, numerological significance of, of creation. You find that in seashells and the human face and things like that. So it's it's a very important, powerful symbol. Um, and it can be written in a lot of ways. It can be a circle with a line all the way through coming out the circle. Uh, it's on there the screen. It's on the screen right now, by the way. Okay, there you go. You see it. And it's actually I put the Deadpool logo there too, because there's a Deadpool commercial. And uh, that's always been the logo for Deadpool. And it's the circle with the line through it. So you can see there on the screen, for those of you, I assume everybody's watching, um, I just bolded, you know, the, the text under it there. It's phi. It's the phallus. It's also the breast, corresponds to the breast of the body. That would be the nurturing, you know, the milk substance of, of the byproduct of a couple's love and the product of, you know, sex and fertility. And it's the golden ratio. You can see it right there and go go look it up for yourself and you know, it's this it's that symbol it's i'm not looking on some weird conspiracy website it's just that's what the symbol is it's a greek it's a greek right and then you have the champions there see that champion banner by the stage and you got the, the line to the sea now we know that is the scent sign that's very simple to point out um it's latin and it means uh 100 i believe is what the latin it's like centus or something like that it's in the the picture there but that particular symbol is also, and this is what I think is fat. This is really fascinating. This gets us to halftime, actually. That particular symbol that starts the word champions, not only the scent sign, it's also in music, which is very mathematical. We already got the golden ratio there. Uh, it's also something that means cut time. Now, what is cut time? Well, halftime kind of sounds, eh, maybe there's a correlation there. That was interesting. So if you scroll down a little bit there in that article that I sent, this is what I put together. Okay. You can scroll down further than that to the next page. Uh, keep going. Okay. There you go. So, okay, now we're looking at the other uh, Super Bowl logo slash banner. So that one was the champions, you know, stage, and this is what the NFL was promoting. Now, listen, I, I'm not looking for things when I watch the Super Bowl. People ask me, what do I look for? Do I look for this Illuminati hand sign? Do I look for this satanic symbol? And I'm like, I don't know. that A pentagram is not a satanic symbol, so I don't know why you'd look for that as a satanic symbol. <laughs> I kind of give it back to people because, you know, symbols, are, are they can mean anything. And the context matters a lot. So I don't know. I'm not looking for these things. I just noticed that you can see there, see Super Bowl, like the E and the R are a different font. That's not my imagination, right? It's a different font. Yeah. And the E is very oddly broken apart, but I guess is that is that uh, that's supposed to be like one side of an arrow going up with the R? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's odd. You you could even I see. I didn't even look at that and see that. It's kind of like the uh, the FedEx logo. The FedEx logo has the arrow that you know to, going to the right. It's like Amazon is A to Z. We have everything from A to Z. I mean, see, that's not an Illuminati conspiracy. That's just how the company designs the logo because it's it's a clever way to design the logo with a little arrow or A to Z. So, I mean, you obviously can see, as your listeners can see, that you know the E and the R are different. And this is going to take us into everything else, you know, that we're going to talk about here. So, the E and the R are different. Now, I went through symbol books. I went through my own like brain trying to you know rack my brain trying to figure out like what, where what is that just a line through e and they just cut it in half like why okay so i looked through i've got a bunch of symbol books i looked through uh everything from uh enochian language to uh there's something called illuminati cipher actually it's like a bunch of incoherent symbols uh which is kind of kind of interesting little uh thing you could type in illuminati cipher and find it online there's a bunch of, and it was actually a real cipher used by Adam Weishaupt. Um, and there's a bunch of other little symbolic uh, characters that I looked through, different alphabets. And the only thing I could come across that resembled any of this was Hebrew. And then I thought, well, let's let's try to support that. Three times during the Super Bowl, at least in my feed, I got ads for Jewish things. I got ads about how Israel was 
going to go get dads out of Hamas or out of the hands of Hamas while Israel was simultaneously bombing Rafa last night, killing, according to the New York Times, 67 people. Six and seven is 13, of course, and 58, the Super Bowl is 5, 8, 13. Maybe talk more about that. But they killed 67 people last night, mostly kids, while they were telling us, we got to go get these dads out of the hands of these Hamas terrorists. He had the commercial about the anti-Jewish hate on the on the the uh, what was that the garage door? Yeah, yeah, they've been running that one since the the uh, the World Series. Oh, have they? Yeah, have they? Yeah, and that one was that I had that on my feed, and then you had the silence one, which was for some weird reason it it said stop Jewish hate, and then it cut and said stop all hate. I guess Jewish hate is more important than all hate, even though J- Jewish people actually suffer i guess hate crimes and those are really manipulated statistics anyway by definition but they suffer hate crimes at a far lower rate than most other I mean, like other groups considering in terms of the population numbers it's weird like why don't you just stop all hate not just jewish hate then we'll move on to the rest of the hate <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird right uh, yeah yeah well there, there's a there's a, a a categorization war that is constantly going on out there um and and usually when it gets that specific you know that it's a def- it's deflecting against some greater truth, especially a statistical truth. Um, like when they stop when they started branding stop Asian hate, uh, yeah. it, it's fairly well known to anybody with a couple of brain cells to rub together that it was not. For example, they were trying to push this as Trump supporters and white supremacists are going after Asians because of COVID, and that just was not the source of the violence. And uh, th- th- so. Whatever or, or Me Too, the Me Too movement. What was that? It was a pseudo feminist deflection a, a, away from what was a brief moment of exposure for Hollywood being this human meat grinder of you know humanitarian need out there. How they're just you know they they tear everybody apart, men, women, children alike. So they created Me Too as a little bit of a deflective thing. So whenever we get down to specifics, the specific hashtags for these types of things. It's never about actually, it, it's always very something very deflective and statistically misleading. That's a really great explanation. A very, very good explanation. Very concise. I completely agree with you 100%. Well, you can use yeah. it tonight with, with Clyde if you want. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Give you some big, some big, uh, big time shout outs. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was a very, very concise and very well said uh, statement. So, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I so I, I that's the that's the secondary point of proof when I'm looking for something. I'm like, well, this okay. The fact that these might this might relate to Hebrew does that have anything to do with the Super Bowl? And I'm like, all these Jewish things and like Jewish hates more important. So, so I was like, okay, well maybe it's Hebrew. So I look at I'm looking at the Hebrew, and you can see there on the video, you see the the image, and that that's a little file I put together. Um, that is the letter Bet or Beth. And it's also quite interesting that the correspondences are house and mother, and of course, Bethlehem, house of bread, Virgo with the wheat, the virgin, it's where Christ was born. The value of that is two. Now, if you look at the E, the E is broken in two. So you would need two bets or two Beths to get that E, if that's what the symbol is, okay? And two and two gives you 22. I just wrote, I literally wrote that down and I did not think anything of it. And then I'm continuing to look to see if I can, I I thought maybe this R was runic. I'm looking at runes, couldn't couldn't find anything. Again, I'm not looking like, oh, I'm going to find it. It's right here. I'm just like, does it correlate with anything? I don't know. So I find the Hebrew, find bet. And then I find Vav and Kof. And I thought, well, maybe if you superimpose them, it would look like the R. Could be a stretch. So I superimpose them, as you can see on the bottom left there, and kind of kind of has an R feel to it, a little bit. And it and I thought, okay, maybe I'm stretching. I really thought I was stretching. I wrote it down. And then I, I noticed something. If you look at the value of Vav, which is liberty, and Kof, which is light, light and liberty, um, the values add up to 25. And when I wrote that down, I thought, that's the score of the game, 25 and 22. So that's like the third layer of confirmation that, okay, we've got these weird symbols. Uh, they don't relate to anything except maybe Hebrew. 
We got all the Jewish stuff during the game. And then on top of that, Kaf is also a primitive form of Phi, which is Greek. So that kind of doubly confirms that. And then the outcome of the numerical, numerological or the numerical sequencing of the position of these things in the alphabet of the Hebrew alphabet is 25 and 22. And you have to have two bets to get 22, and there's two parts to the E. So it, it comes out 25, 20, which is the, if you scroll down, as you can see, that's the score of the game. Okay, so let me ask you right there. So for, for the average person who's listening to this, and I consider myself one of those people too. I, Me first, too, actually. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I understand, but, but but you know, as far as comparing our um, the, the time put into this kind of study, uh, for you to spot this stuff is really incredible. And but then I I ask myself, all right, how the hell? I mean, twenty five, twenty two. So what is what does this all mean? Because you can't, I can't bring myself to think, and I know that you're not suggesting that this was a predetermined outcome or anything like that, but we are in the realm of synchronicity. So um, can you just explain how, explain the, the, the whole point of synchronicity and where it comes in and where significance in these kind of reoccurring, strangely matching um, factors really comes into play in analyzing a situation that it's not about this was predestined or this was in some way specifically and fixed down to the minutia to make sure that 25 and 22 was produced as an end result for some ritualistic purpose. But there's a, there's a synchronicity here. Can you explain like what the, the significance of that is? It's a really great question. And uh, I usually discuss that every year on my Super Bowl show. As I said, I'm not looking for these things. Uh, synchronicity is simply a simultaneous appearing of patterned symbols, uh, occurrences, et cetera, that essentially don't really have any, there isn't really a justified logical reason mm. for why seeing the pattern that you're seeing. I would attribute it, although it's kind of a tired trope and I personally don't like using the, the phrase red pilled, I would attribute it to kind of like the matrix where um, I forget the character's name. Was it the guy that works the computer and he's like, I don't even, once you look at this long enough, you don't even see code. I think it was the guy that sold them out to the machines, whatever his name was. He said, I don't even see code anymore. I just see blonde, brunette, redhead. Yeah. That's kind of what it feels like to me. It's not like it's some grand conspiracy. We certainly don't know what to call it. So we have a word synchronicity, but that doesn't really define it or describe it or explain what it is. So it's basically like reading the code in the matrix. And also I think a lot of it could be let's just use the word for, for lack of a better word, it's energy. I mean, energies attract each other. We know this in relationships, sex. We know this in the things that we as individuals like, like I like Japanese paintings, as you can see behind me here. I don't know what energetic relationship I have with those or what they have with me, but I like them. I like, you know, Japanese and Chinese and Korean and different forms of script because I like the symbols. I think it's beautiful and fascinating. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a conspiracy like it doesn't nothing everything has to be a conspiracy not everything has to be um even a synchronicity some things are just energetically magnetically attracted it's like one of the laws of nature so perhaps when these things are being chosen i mean if we look at if we looked at it from the point of view of like everything is predetermined god predetermines everything right well maybe everything is predetermined in a sense every outcome is possible simultaneously so when people, the Super Bowl has so much attention and focus on it, when the people are putting this all together, maybe there is some, let's say, energy in the universal field, if you will. And I'm not trying to use these words to sound wacky. I'm just, I don't, there isn't a language to really describe what we're looking at here, I don't think. But maybe that energy influences the people that pick these things and they kind of, they do it in a way that is, it's, it's just happenstance. It doesn't have any other meaning. Um, and it also... I guess more specifically to the 25 and 22, I want to reiterate that when I saw those symbols, I went through a bunch of alphabets, a bunch of symbol books. The only thing that seemed relevant was the Hebrew alphabet. And then with all the Jewish stuff during the game, the commercials, I thought, okay, well, that kind of is like secondary confirmation. And then the fact that one of those symbols, Kaf, is very much like Phi, which is undeniable in the bowl and champion's word, undeniable, that's what it is. It's Phi, it's a Greek. Um, that's like third confirmation. 
And then the fact that they added the 25 and 22, I was sitting right here on the couch and I wrote that down and I just, I looked at it, I was like, wait, that was the score of the game. <laughs> so that's like the fourth or fifth confirmation. Like I, I, what it means, I don't know, but it's not just, oh, look, that symbol relates to that. I know you're not saying that, but it's like not that session relates to that. Blah, blah, blah. And you're like writing the, this complex red, you know, putting that red uh, yarn, connecting all these dots. It's just all these correlations, they all relate to the same event. And it just so happens to be that those are the numbers that come up that that, that we come up with. I, I don't think that it necessarily means anything per se. I just think that it's fascinating. And if you look one more time at that image, I took a screenshot or a photo of the uh, one of the symbol books I have, and I put it in that little file for myself. And you can find those, you can find an inverted version of both of those symbols in the literal it's called the Illuminati cipher. It was a real cipher used by Adam Beishop. So I thought, ah, that's kind of interesting too. So I threw that in you there. You know, as well. uh, you, when you were talking about the the the, the and if, and if I'm going to throw any of my uh, analytical two cents in, um, yes. I, were you able to see? And maybe you just didn't have the time to check it out. But in Super Bowls past, even just within the last three or four Super Bowls, did you see any of those phallic? uh symbols put in there with the o's or anything like that because if not it would be a another pretty telling presentation since there is this overarching theme with this year's super bowl of this made match made in hollywood heaven kind of a coupling of the the, the tight end with uh taylor swift and and everybody want, people wondering if there was going to be a proposal and if they're getting married and all that stuff so it was very uh, you know, daytime soap opera romancy on top of everything else. It was. And in fact, I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I, I can add something else that I think might might blow some people's minds that also relates to what you just said. And in regard to what we just discussed, um, if you go back to the image, just so you can see it side by side and look at the the purple banner that says Super Bowl, if you scroll up a couple pages, it's the set. Yeah, right there. Um, of all those letters, I just realized this a couple hours ago, actually. So I had prepared all this. I sent some stuff to Clyde for our show tonight because I'm going to be on Ground Zero. And then my show, I prepared this for my show. I had it set for my show and I sent it to you. And I looked at it and I just realized it. I was like, oh, my God. The three letters that are, that, that, that you know, they have a different font are E-R-O. What is E-R-O? Arrow. Not only is it arrow as an arrow, like Arrowhead Stadium or the Chiefs logo or anything like that, but it's arrow as in the arrow that Cupid pokes you with so you fall in love or you get real horny and want to have sex, all fertility stuff. But arrow is a is the Greek name for the god of love and fertility and passion. And not only that, but what is Wednesday? Valentine's Day. So of all the letters that could be played with, it just so happens to spell out the name or, I mean, his name is E-R-O or E-R-O-S, Eros, but it spells the name of a Greek god of love, the week of Valentine's Day. So that is also quite peculiar. And, of course, Eros is also a, a, a god of, well, not really necessarily a god of fertility per se, but through love and passion and sex, I mean, effectively fertility, which then also relates back to phi with the golden ratio, which is also a symbol of the phallus and yoni, and that's fertility as well. So that I found, I just noticed that a few hours ago. I thought, well, that's that's really weird. And it relates directly. See, all those different second, third, fourth layers of confirmation rather than just being like, oh, the reptilians ran the Super Bowl. You know, <laughs> to me, this makes a lot more sense. And I find that really weird, especially because Wednesday's val Valentine's Day or what it's an old Roman festival called Lupercalia. Yes. Uh, as well. Wednesday is also the beginning of Lent. It's Ash Wednesday. Um, oh, that's so there's a lot a lot of a lot of different things going on this uh this this week but um but okay okay yeah well i, I tend to think that the uh, that the uh, reptilians still have a little something to do with all this but let's keep going uh yeah, let's yeah. let's yeah, keep I'm going now we get to the, the halftime show you said right yeah we're gonna get there in just one second because we, before we do that we need to see who's overseen it in a sense scroll up uh i think to the second page right above that yeah the file i sent you must have pushed those pictures down but so before we, we get to that, let's just look at the, you know, CBS. So you got a couple things with CBS, right? CBS is literally an all-seeing eye. Hmm. CBS is, is also 
to see BS. <laughs> kind of a funny thing to play with, right? <laughs> so if you if you scroll down, it, it I guess it inverted your your um your file there. Yeah, it's uh well well the eye of Sauron is 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 right side up, but the other one I know what you I know what you're looking at there too. I said, what the hell is this tool? What is this like a Olympic style torch that is directly above the goalposts yeah. here? What is this torch? And people, I, I automatically, every, I saw people saying, this is like Lord of the Rings. And yeah, it, it, I don't know when this became a thing or if it's just native to this stadium in, in Las Vegas or what, but that, that's very odd. Let me see if I can get a better image up. Go ahead and talk about it. I, I pulled it up here. You can see it really close on the screen there. Yeah. The tw- this on my phone. Now, I don't remember what play this was. I think it was the one, final one of the game because I was trying to get a picture of it all night. But it just so happens to be when I took the picture, look at the dialogue from the uh, from the announcers. I want you to watch on the. <laughs> I just thought that was funny because the Eye of Sauron watches. Um, that is a basically a, a cauldron that they lit like the Olympics. You're right, like the Olympics uh, before the game. And it is part of the Allegiant Stadium, who their logo on top of it says Allegiant. And on top of it, if you look up Allegiant Stadium, it has uh, a rays of the sun. So it's like a rising sun and then the flaming torch, uh, which are very common symbols and motifs you, you'd see around everything from the death of Kennedy to Princess Diana's m- memorial as well. The, uh, the never ending, never uh, burned out torch. Um, so, And then, you know, people say, well, that's Lucifer. Well, perhaps a bearer of light, but like the Statue of Liberty bears that torch, not because she's Lucifer. She's actually the guy that kind of came up with the the, the structure of her, actually took the imagery from Nubian or African Egyptian uh, goddesses. And that light was an illuminating force of the underworld, which is actually the eye of Horus, who uses the eye for his father so he can see in the underworld. It's a, it's a symbol of illumination and light. Um, and there's different forms of light and illumination. There's false light and there's good light, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, yes, there's a giant cauldron torch and it looks like the Eye of Sauron. Um, but, you know, let's, putting that aside, I just thought that was interesting to point out. Well, let me um, ask you, let me ask, real quick on that, because you're talking about illumination in the uh, in the underworld. And I, I, in a lot of my reading into stuff like this, I have seen that uh, those who were very, you know, well versed in the 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 world of the occult and secret societies and all that, that everyday folk, common folk, would be considered or referred to sometimes as the dead, as yep. you know those those of us out here who are not who are really just going through life, not really understanding what the real what the real uh, you know the real game that's being played is that we're kind of oblivious and. And just existing in this this little breakaway shallow reality, whereas they are the the the, the holders of of true insight into the nature of the world and all that stuff that that we are you know you know regular people are referred to in all types of demeaning ways. Um, but I always heard that the dead is one of them, so it would make a lot of sense that to be illuminated in the land of the dead is pretty much the same kind of imagery that's being put out there with these torches. In the, land, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is always king. Yeah. And you're the uh, in all the mystery schools and secret societies, or most most of the ones that were drama based, including masonry, which I, I maintain these schools are just as positive as they are negative. I mean, many of them were infiltrated in the same way that, like, you know, church isn't bad, but churches have been infiltrated, and you know, mosques aren't necessarily bad, but mosques have been infiltrated, and so on and so forth. Um, you have the process by which you would in, interact with uh, other characters played by members of a lodge or an order, and they would play the planets or different gods and goddesses. And you go through a ritualistic process of death and resurrection while you were alive. They call it living resurrection. And you'd usually leave the temple and you greet the eastern rising sun. So the rising sun comes up, you greet the sun, you are actually born again. That's where the Christians get their idea from, born again Christians. And then you become a son of God as opposed to a son of man. You greet you greet the sun. And so that's a practice that was probably much, much older than Egypt. We don't know how, how far back that practice goes, but it was a way to tune yourself, if you will, 
with the cycles of nature and the processes by which the seasons change, which is where we get the apocalypse from, the lifting of the veil. That's the apocalypse. That's the uh, uh, the fall into the winter months. And then the pale horse is death that brings cold and death and chaos and darkness. And that's the pale horse. And then the white horse, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, and a bunch of other prophets and gods rode. The white horse is spring and the red horse is summer and the black horse is fall and the cycle continues. And you can look at the same thing with the human the human brain or the human mind or the idea of like our reptile brain. See, I, I call that the red dragon and I call the animal self and the ego the beast. And the red dragon in Revelation gives the beast its authority to do what it does. And it's thrown, it's seat between the eyes, the third eye, right? It's like you're... It's who you are as a person. It's your, your personality, your persona, your mask. So if you kill the dragon, kill that reptile brain that controls all these things, or at least you subdue it, you acquire the gold of the alchemists. So these things can be looked at as both internal psychological processes and the unconscious. If you read Carl Jung, he, he describes the unconscious as more of a, um, as the underworld. And the illumination of that underworld is being enlightened about what all this stuff means like joseph campbell wrote so that it doesn't control you and i think that's the positive if you will side to all of this talk of secret societies and conspiracies yeah but I, there's a two yeah I, I i i would say if there is a positive side that would be one of them now let me ask you real quick ryan because i have to go on a a very brief intermission break. How much more time would you be able to allot us tonight, just so we can touch a little bit on the actual performances of the, the halftime show? But I know you have a very busy broadcast schedule tonight. Um, I could do, uh, when you come back from break, you get a half hour, and then you go to another break, or do you have a whole uh, hour? No, I, I got a whole hour, but I can I can give you up to 20, 25 minutes, whatever is good for you. That If you can only do 10, 15, I'll take that as well. We'll, we'll we'll do uh we'll say I'm actually doing, not doing bad right now in terms of time so let's do a half hour and I might be able to talk longer. Okay, half hour would be fine because then I want to take some calls afterwards and uh, and we'll figure that out. I'm gonna put you on mute real quick and uh, ladies and gentlemen, um I we were gonna be right back on the other side of this break. We are back on the other side of intermission. We have Ryan Gable here hanging out with me. It's quite frankly on Monday night. It's the 12th day of February 2024. Plenty of spookiness going on post Super Bowl spookiness. Here's a little bit of something for you, Ryan. I had this uh, come in from a member of the audience. Valsky just sent in a super chat. And said, hey, you want to know what the address of uh, Allegiant Stadium is? It is 3333 Al Davis Way, Las Vegas, 89118. That's a pair of 33s for you, Ryan. Yes, and you know how many yards Patrick Mahomes passed for? No, what he's passed for? 333 yards. you got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about those 13s. and the. I'm sure you know a little bit about that. Which? All the 13s associated with this game. Oh, oh, okay. Did it, I was reading something about this. It was uh, so it comes down to a, a birthday, July 13th. Who was born on the 13th of July? Go ahead. Put it all out there. Well, that's okay. That that one I actually don't know. Uh, and there's a couple that are really obvious. And again, just like with the symbols we looked at earlier, I don't necessarily think that this has some deeper conspiratorial meaning. I think it's like reading the green code in the matrix, if you will. And it has to do with magnets and energy and things like that, or make magnetic attraction. So 58, Super Bowl 58, five, five plus eight. Now, if you, if you could do this with plus and minus and multiplication and then get there, it would it'd be different. But if, you, if we're talking about just addition, then the 13 start pouring out. So five plus eight, 58, Super Bowl, 13. February 11th, uh, 211, 13. Bunch of, there's a, there's so many of these it's crazy. Uh, Super Bowl halftime score was 10-3, 13. Carl Weathers died, Black History Month, February 1st. He was was he 76 years old? That's 13. He played for the 49ers, which is where this game was, you know, at, at their home now in Vegas. Uh, he wore the number uh, 49, which is 13. Um, now, what's really interesting, although we could continue to go down this long, 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 long list of 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, the 49ers, 4 plus 9, 13, uh, Brock Purdy's number, the Super Bowl quarterback, 13, 
Um, we can go down this list over and over and over again, but I think what's really interesting is the relationship to Taylor Swift that the number 13 plays. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. Well, this is really interesting. I just, just learned this this weekend. I didn't know how, she, how obsessed she was with the number 13. She's, I'm going to read this to you. This is from my little my monologue from tonight. This is what she said. And this wasn't like last night, but she said this a couple of weeks ago. A couple months. It might have been a couple months ago. This was reported. Quote, I was born on the 13th. I turned 13 on Friday the 13th. My first album went gold in 13 weeks. My first number one song had a 13-second intro. Every time I've won an award, I've been seated in either the 13th seat, the 13th row, the 13th section, or row M, which is the letter 13, the 13th letter. Basically, whenever a 13 comes up in my life, it's a good thing. We can go further than that, though. That's her quote. I'm going to go further. This was her 13th NFL game this year. On the 4th of February, she also won her 13th Grammy. Her heiress tour, E-R-A-S, began on Friday the 13th, October Friday the 13th. It also had a 13-week exclusive theatrical release. This is all confirmable. This was like Screen Rants movie websites. 13-week theatrical release that just ended right before the Super Bowl. Funny enough. 13 comes up in a bunch of other places too. But before we go any further into what the 13 represents... How about we take a look at, well, uh, is that whole thing with the 12 disciples of Christ and Jesus is number 13, resurrection, 13 is resurrection in numerology. There's also the Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur. There's also the signs of the Zodiac, and they've added a new sign years ago, Ophiuchus, the serpent. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey were both born in 1989, which was the year of the serpent. She uses the serpent and a lot of her music, and her, probably her most one of her most famous songs, Look What You Made Me Do, is filled with death and resurrection. She actually does the Egyptian Osiren pose, which is the crook and flail hurting in the age of Taurus the bull, and the age of, uh, well, the, well, the bull to the ram, which in, and later went to the age of the fish, which was the Christian age, um, which also features in that song her, uh, her alter egos, the number 13 tattooed on her hand, her favorite number, her mocking the crucifixion of Christ on the cross uh, and a bunch of other weird stuff like her in a red dress sitting on a giant golden throne with the Ides of March reference when Caesar was killed with serpents serving her tea like the poison apple in the Garden of Eden. Or if you read that book about the Antichrist by Tim Cohen, the Antichrist in a cup of tea, the red dress is, of course, the Scarlet Woman, the Whore of Babylon. And you saw Alicia Keys wearing that at the halftime show. Jeez, I mean, it was one thing for her to be sitting at the piano with the old red sequin uh, dress on there, but it was another thing to have that striking imagery of the red, I don't know, uh, trail that was just, I don't know, half a mile long. It was, inc it yeah. was incredible. I said, whoa, okay, red lady. Man, oh, yes. man. Yeah, but that's, and that same image and that motif is all in the music industry. Like, I... um I looked up again last night. I watched uh, a song by Avril Lavigne uh, called uh, I Fell in Love with the Devil. You could look it up. And she actually goes through the whole process by which we saw the halftime show unfold, where she starts out, she's in white, and then she ends up in black robes like Taylor Swift has famously worn. And then she ends up in the red dress playing on a piano with a crucifix talking about how she fell in love with the devil. And, and I should note here that the devil and Satan are two different characters. Satan is Shaitan, the adversary. So that is necessary evil that we need. It's resistance. Like when we have an injury and we have to train and we have to go into water and get resistance on our bodies or go to the gym and lift weights, like Shaitan is a necessary evil. The devil is a different character. The devil is, if you remove the D, evil, even if you keep the D, the devil, if you reverse evil or devil, you get lived or live. So the devil is an inversion of what it means to live in the same way that if you reverse love, L-O-V-E, -E, evil, or if you reverse life, L-I-F-E, E-F-I-L, you get ethel. And however you pronounce it in both twilight language and magical context means the same thing. Life, love, and to live, inverted, is evil. 
So anybody trying to distort and destroy those things would be considered evil and working with the devil. They'd be devil worshipers, but devil worshipers are really fundamentally, philosophically, and symbolically totally different than Satan worshipers. And I think that's a very important distinction for your audience uh, to, for me to point out before we go any further. Uh, so in relation to all these 13s, um, it's really interesting that the 13th sign of the zodiac, Ophiuchus, I'm going to look this up to make sure I know how to pronounce it. There's a star. This is really weird, man. There's a star in Ophiuchus named Ophiuchi or Ophiuchi, O-P-H-I-U-C-H-I. -H -I. That star, this all comes together really weird. That star is numbered 58. That star, because Ophiuchus is the, the serpent and that he, he who betrays like in the Garden of Eden, and that is what causes death. The serpent causes death. So 58 and death and the... Uh, Allegiant Stadium. I heard. I turned on. I have no idea how I got so lucky to hear this. And, I, and unless everybody knows this, and I didn't know this, I mean, that's possible. I turned on some like Australian NFL broadcast, and they were like, "This is really weird. We're here at Allegiant Stadium. Did you know that Allegiant Stadium is called the Death Star? They actually refer to it as the Death Star. That's really weird." I thought I'd never heard that anywhere. I've been to Vegas a lot. I've never heard anybody so it was the Death Star. So I looked it up, and apparently that's the that's like the name. The, the pseudonym, if you will, for that stadium is the Death Star. So you have Death Star, and then you literally have 58, so go 58, 58, Ophi, Ophiuki, which is that single star in that constellation, then all the 13s. Like, that's just, it's like, I'm not I know, I know. <laughs> this is why I have to ask. Be, and, and I think I really, this is why I really appreciate when you when you uh, brought up the Matrix reference, that it's it's not necessarily about um, about things being predestined or somebody... Uh, putting this all together and you know some you know I, I to a large degree do believe that there is less and less room for coincidence but yeah. when, but what you were saying there about how it's more so about watching things play out before us being a part of us I mean we're all part of the same timeline of events you know we're contributing we're contributing to the the, the back end um, you know binary language feed as, as anybody else but these are more visible public events that everybody is playing this observer. You know, we're playing the observer on a lot of these things. It's not like our lives where we go throughout the day and as we are just interacting with local shops and, and, uh, and, or doing radio sh shows like this, who knows what the binary unseen language of all the stuff that we're involved in pops up, all the different synchronicities and, and things that line up. And so it's more so about, this is the unseen, as you said, language of reality. It kind of lends itself to, to you know, you know, the theorizing about the unseen language of reality. And of course, on these grander state, grander scales, um, it uh, I, I guess it behooves us to pay a little bit more attention to people who are plugged into networks of organizations, governments, this and that, who know this stuff, whereas those of us in the land of the dead know less than anybody else so uh for those who know they take advantage now I, my question has always been okay so you know a little bit more than most what how does it ingrate how does it empower you to plan an event around numerological patterns that you see how does it energize or charge an event how does it benefit you i mean what does the numbers itself mean i i ask that of a lot of astrologers who come on this show you know why declare war or start a business when planets are in certain alignment i i want to know the physical impact because obviously the synchronicities are there they're abundant so i want to know the physical impact on taking advantage of these of these patterns i have an opinion for you and and take it for what it's worth you know the it's very well known, or I think it is very well known, that Wall Street investors, people that work on Wall Street, have used astrology to make investments. This is in contemporary times, of course. We know that, well, let's look at, how about Prince William? Prince William, his birth was induced, so he would be born on the summer solstice. Um, if you look at a lot of wars that were especially under the Bush administration, they were initiated you know, begun or significant parts of those wars, the ending of those wars, if you will, uh, the mission accomplished. These things were done on very important, significant dates, not just any dates, not just random dates, but like 
high Jewish holidays, which the whole idea behind those wars was that we were fighting Israel's wars in the Middle East, which is weird. Um, Or uh, in the case of uh, a a, a number of like very significant dates around Beltane, for example, like Beltane, which comes up in mid-April, it's called the burning season. And you get everything from the assassination of Abraham Lincoln to Waco to Oklahoma City to the sinking of Titanic, Hitler's death, and the list just goes on and on, where you find significant dates elsewhere throughout the year. But around that time in particular, they're like super duper concentrated, at least the ones that our attention is focused on. So maybe there's a magnetic thing happening there universally. I think the best way to respond to your question is to say that, one, regardless of what you, me, or anybody listening believes, if someone really believes these things, just like your neighbor really, really believes in God and they're a really big time Christian, nothing you can say is going to convince them otherwise. They're probably going to see apparitions. They're going to read their Bible and think that God's telling them something. And maybe he is. They're going to go to church and they're going to feel that power of God, the presence of God with them. And that's just your neighbor, if you will. That doesn't account for the people that have lots of money, lots of time, and they have the ability or maybe the family background to study types these types of things in great detail and depth. Uh, there's a singer named Florence Welsh. She's one of my favorite singers, Florence and the Machine. She literally studied to, she like her mom was a professor and she was in a witch's coven and she uses her knowledge of witchcraft and mythology and archetypes to make her music. And she actually does a pretty positive job in her music about that kind of stuff then you look at people like Billie Eilish, who I don't think she knows what she's doing. Billie Eilish, like we've talked, I don't know if I've talked with you much about her, but like her entire image is based around worshiping the demon ball. We don't have time to get into why I think that, but it's take, if you took my word for it, it's like the, the people, whether we think it or not, are obsessed with these kinds of things because they believe that it gives them power. The same way a Christian believes Jesus helps them or a Muslim believes the prophet Muhammad is there to protect them, or they see, you know, they see Allah. Um, or if you're Buddha and you see, you, or rather you are Buddhist and you, you have a vision of Buddha, um, these people clearly believe that certain dates and times are significant. And over thousands and thousands of years, in fact, so much time, we don't even know the worship of goddesses like Isis, the worship of gods that come under various different names, Saturn, Kronos, which is chronology for time. Uh, you know, we all these different gods, goddesses and characters in the books and the stories we read in school, we read at home, we see movies and TV, they're reservoirs of energy. So tapping into them are going to also once if you can tap into them, it's going to tap you into both your own unconscious and subconscious, but also into the subconscious of other people. So I've always said the Super Bowl, because so many people watch like hundreds of millions of people watch during and after it is the ultimate opportunity to sell products. It's the ultimate opportunity to sell political messages. It's the ultimate opportunity to perform, if you're an occultist, some sort of bizarre, for us, bizarre maybe, but for them not so much, ritual. Because, and here's, I think this is where the language part, the magic comes in. What happens when you pay attention? You're using your energy, you're paying, you're focusing, you're paying attention. What are you paying with, with your attention? Energy, you're using your energy to pay attention. Energy is currency. What do we call our money? Currency. It's electricity. It's energy. We exert energy to get money. Then we use that money to buy other things. And we pay for a movie ticket. Then we pay attention to the movie. This is what we're doing with the Super Bowl. All those people watching, all those people listening, all the advertisements, the millions and millions of dollars in a a minute or $10 million a minute or whatever it is, all the political messaging, what makes us think that based on the archetypes of all the things we see at halftime alone, let alone other weird things around the game, like the symbols we talked about earlier, why wouldn't somebody use that as an opportunity to, at the very least, at the very base minimum, play with people and make fun of them, which is exactly what we see happening today, where you have literally the the NFL at the beginning of the season had a whole campaign about how the NFL was scripted and the Super Bowl was rigged. They, they called it, you know, the NFL is rigged. That's the conspiracy. The NFL actually did a whole commercial series about that. Um, or the fact that uh, Joe Biden, well, his handlers put on his Twitter account today, this dark Brandon image with his eyes red and glowing like t- the Terminator and yeah. said, it's just what we planned. They're, they troll you. So like it's it's either it's either it's it's all completely made up, but we've we've created it. We're the ones that manufactured this Illuminati stuff. <laughs> 
or it's like partly real and then some of it's fabricated. But regardless of how you look at it, the evidence is there. It's overwhelming. It's just a matter of what it means. And I think we've gotten to a point now where people have pushed the envelope and the question so far that now from the White House to the NFL, they, they're playing with the conspiracy. Yeah. So, I, let, me, let me ask you this, uh, because yeah. some people in the chat room, they dropped a couple of key words in there. I saw uh, somebody say mind control operation, louche. Somebody else dropped in hypnotize, hip, hip, uh, you know, hypnotizing people. Uh, my question to you is, and, I, and obviously human will, human attention paid, uh, it's all going to be a benefit to those receiving the attention. But I uh, I wonder because you know so much of so much of, of the so called civil rights movements of the day that they say they're civil rights movements it's usually as we see over time like for example with Black Lives Matter Patrice Cullors one of the the founders of Black Lives Matter she's been very forthright about how she is a trained Marxist but also uh, incorporates a lot of witchcraft and ritualistic behavior into the way that they demonstrate. They call, they call it Aoife, right? It was their practitioner. It's yeah. called Aoife magic, Western African Aoife magic. Yeah. And, and, they, and they said they said very the very clearly that when they, they get people together for these for these uh, rallies or these parades or whatever, or even when they organize people online, these hashtags, they are more than hashtags. They are ways, they said that they are invoking the spirits of people, whether they were lost in an altercation with police or some other way that they're invoking spirits. And when, when I, I did a show on this a couple of years ago, because it, it became apparent to me uh, how, how, Verily advantageous, the current um, detached, spiritually detached culture that we have in the United States is where uh, so much of this Marxist propaganda drags uh, people, whereas if this was two or three generations ago, uh, whole families are going to church together on Sunday. They're sticking together. They're, 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 they're doing religious studies. They're engaging in the sacraments. They're faithful, a lot more than that. It is now all this in, in modern day, um, it is so much more hip, uh, and it's also not even just hip, it's just a standard that agnosticism and atheism has been nurtured and massaged into the mainstream culture of society so that people have become spiritual empty voids where there's no ed spiritual education there, there's no faith background, and whereas they think that they are secular and uh, not being held down by any kind of religion, they are actually being indoctrinated into a religion passively, and... Um, and by showing up to these so-called civil rights rallies, they're actually engaging in religious ritual, and they don't even know it. So my question to you is, even though attention paid across the board is going to benefit those who are doing the operation, do you believe that it is more advantageous to them to receive passive attention and passive interaction or to receive the, um, the, the, the more active and knowing kind of attention? Just my opinion. First of all, it's a great question. I've always said that passive would be the the desire the desirable type of attention. Why? Because, because then there's no competition. Well, you're really getting into the unconscious mind then, and that's where the 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 work and the damage can can be done. That's what I would say anyway. Yeah, man, oh man, and yeah. and and also, uh, you know, in regard to everything we we've, we've thus discussed, cause we, we still got plenty of time, I think, to talk about halftime. <laughs> because uh, we went through the 13 and we just kind of ended up here the uh the halftime show we'd mentioned alicia keys if you watch just a brief overview if you watch the transition once again it's it, i mean they're they're not choosing the colors by accident it's intentional you'll notice that it starts off with the way that the lighting looks i actually thought usher was wearing yellow at first but it starts off where he gets up he's got white on he has a gigantic phoenix bird pin or something attached to his white clothing. So he's he's white, so purity. The phoenix rises. Okay, and then it transitions and it gets a little darker as it goes. And we get to the red lady, Alicia Keys. Usher at the beginning stands inside of a magic circle. I don't know if anybody caught that. It's a dark area and then a white line around it it's it's literally the same one they've used at multiple super bowls it's not just oh let's look how they lit the stage 
it's like literally the same line. It's the same white circle. It's a magic circle that they literally have them standing inside of. That is not a coincidence, and that's not my imagination. So then it transitions. He ends up with his shirt off at <laughs> at some point, and then we go from uh, black clothing and uh, her, some singer named her. I didn't know who that was. Had this black goo like clothing on, if you will, the red guitar, and then that was quickly out of the frame. And then we end up with uh, the at toward the end, we end up with everything turning blue. And it looked it reminded me of Tron, actually, the blue at the end and the way that the lights were the grid on the ground. See, there's the magic circle there. That that's what that is. It's not a it's not a an opinion. That that is what that's what a magic circle is, especially when you got the red lady motif inside of it. <laughs> I mean, as for as an archetype alone, that's just very obvious, I think. So it transitions, the long, long point is, long story short, is transitions from purity and white through the red and through the black, and then we get to this digital-looking environment. My interpretation of that is that we're talking here, since we've discussed resurrection, some of these symbols. Um, by the way, February 11th is also the resurrection feast of Osiris, the green man, god of agriculture and fertility, who is the beast slayer who is god of resurrection in the underworld so that february that's february 11th in the old world and then bringing in the new paradigm the new doctrine which clearly is digital technological ai driven that's not necessarily a bad thing but i see that's what it is i, I talk about how, how could something be rigged it's like well there's point shaving there's covering the spread gambling like all, all that i'm not a big I'm not a gambler, so I don't know much about it, but I know that, that is a real form of rigging that takes place. You know, one ref can be paid off. The whole thing doesn't have to be scripted. And I don't think it's like scripted or rigged in the sense of we interpret those words. Something could be rigged in a totally different way. I proposed this like a month ago. And then after the Super Bowl, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, oh my God, I got to do another show on this. They're talking about, uh, it was the last, one of the last commercials before the feed switched over to the C this new T uh, CBS show after the game and the award ceremony, there was a commercial for Amazon's AI. And, and you've probably seen this if you watched any kind of sports. I don't know if baseball does it, the hockey does it, football does it for sure, um, where they talk about, you know, should they go for it on fourth down? Should they kick the field goal here to go for the go for the touchdown? Should they go for the extra point? You know, should they pull the goaltender right now? That kind of stuff based on statistics, based on what the algorithm says. Okay, well, based on millions of plays analyzed. Here's your percentage of getting the first down. Millions of plays analyzed, millions of two-minute drills in football or two-minute drills in hockey. These are the chances of you scoring a goal if you pull your goalie here. You got a better chance if you wait another three seconds, pull your goalie here. You got a 5% chance more of scoring a goal. In a sense, and that's what that's how the game ended on my feed anyway on CBS. They were talking about this AI and how it analyzes so much data it can effectively predict plays and whatnot before they happen. So it doesn't have to be scripted in a, in a, in a Hollywood sense, if you will. But with artificial intelligence now, which just is learning from the things that we, we already have and what we do, it clearly can essentially predict what's going to happen. On, and the more we play, the more it's going to be able to predict. It's essentially able to predict what is going to happen on any given play. I mean, just the nature of how that could be used for gambling alone is beyond my comprehension and my pay grade. But to when you're dealing with hundreds and you don't deal with billions of dollars um, on the line, like uh, what, 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 why wouldn't somebody not utilize that to the best of their um, knowledge to rig a game in a totally different way where no one has to be involved, but you just work through the AI and the AI is basically influencing the game or rigging the game, if you will. And I and, and another another thing about that is um, talk about the, the the financial aspect of all this. I don't think it's weird that the Chiefs were in the play in the playoffs of the Super Bowl. They're a good team. They've been in like four of the last five Super Bowls: 2020, 2021, 2023, 2024. It's like I think it's like two, and then they missed one, then two again. It's not weird that they would be in or win the Super Bowl. Um, it's not weird that Taylor Swift might endorse Joe Biden. She did that four years ago, right? It, you know, th th like that's the weird conspiracy that doesn't really make any sense to me. But the Chiefs in the Super Bowl 
Um, you know, you don't really need to know football to be able to predict that. If you have just a minor knowledge of what's going on, you're like, well, they're a really, really good team. But because they're such, on top of that, because they're such a good team, um, the AI, obviously, you know, it, it can effectively probably predict those, I would assume, those better teams even more so than a bad team because they're so good for so long and they they tend to win a lot, then it's probably even easier to predict that. And that could actually, that could fall as a, as a negative thing on any team that they face until their roster dwindles and Mahomes retires. And, and it's a similar, like with Taylor Swift in regard to the Chiefs, this what the NFL estimated she made them three hundred and thirty one million dollars and garnered five million additional fans for the NFL and for and like I don't know how many million for the Chiefs like that. We're talking number. Th- those are gigantic numbers, man. Yeah, I know There's, someone isn't looking into how to utilize that, even if it's organic in its development. Someone's looking into how to exacerbate that and make it make it even more powerful, more money, more more attention. Oh, I brought that up. I brought that up. I, I I only had to estimate because it came up in the middle of the show, in the middle of the, the game yesterday, and I didn't know where to even start looking into it. But as far as the every year, the rates, the advertising rates, they they get published and they go up commensurate yeah. every year. But I said to myself, and I said to somebody, I said I would I wouldn't be surprised if it's at least a quarter million dollars more per per minute. Uh, at least just because you know what kind of what kind of a, a attention is being brought in here by this this ridiculous celebrity romance and um and I, I so there's there is that I understand there's a lot more now whether they're fans or whether I, I think it's more rubbernecking than it is fans of the NFL if you're gonna if you're gonna ask me but then again if we're talking about a game in which human attention is the grand prize. Then all you need is rubbernecking, you know. I, I don't think they really care about making lifelong NFL fans out of a a loose connection to uh, a pop star. But um, yeah, it, was, it, it definitely be, it made it a. It, too bad it wasn't more. It wasn't a more exciting game. I think that would have won them some fans. It was a really boring game. But uh, right. yeah. Well, you know, there was a commercial for uh, Cetaphil, which is I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's like a lotion. And it was about a dad watching football and his daughter didn't really want to watch it or something. I think that was the theme of it. And then uh, apparently Taylor Swift shows up at the game. So the daughter wants to come in and watch it. And the dad gets her a jersey. I thought this was just interesting. The dad gets her a jersey and gives her the jersey in the commercial. And it's a red jersey. And it's got number 13 on it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I was, and then I looked it up and it was like, they gave her the, it says in the article, I read a couple articles about the uh, commercial they gave her the 13 jersey because that's Taylor Swift's favorite number. Oh. So they using 13 to draw in new fans too in the commercial. Like the I, I don't know. I feel like am I being sold something here? Am I being trolled? Am I being uh, you know subtly manipulated? Like what's happening here? Because this is so mainstream now. It's like that Taco Bell commercial like five years ago where they had like Bigfoot and the Illuminati ritual or something like some secret society. This stuff is so mainstream now. It's so blatantly obvious that it's almost it's almost in a sense, in my opinion, it's almost easier to pick out the real stuff because the fake stuff is just so it's like it's what's the word? It's like cheap. It's so cheap. Like, oh. Well, well, that was that was an Illuminati halftime show, and it's like, yes, focus on that, so you don't recognize these symbols in the words that are only in some of the words in some of the promotions. Focus on the Illuminati, so you don't recognize things that otherwise you might recognize. So it's almost like a form of another form of distraction is is what I see that it could in and of itself be. But it's it's certainly a way to commodify and monetize both resistance to powerful people who are obsessed with this stuff and uh, to monetize and modify um, just the public's interest in the unknown. And the more crazy society gets and the wacky our, our president gets who can barely speak and doesn't know where he's at, you know, people just start thinking this is more and more of a joke. And then you just, and then they just troll you about it, which is what they did on Twitter with Joe Biden's account this morning. I mean, yep. that is just, you saw that? That is unbelievable, man. No way. And, and, and I saw a couple of top comments were really on par with that. Like, this was tweeted out at a time. That man was on his eighth dream already. So, <laughs> I mean, there was no, he was not up tweeting 
thinking of some really i mean we're, we're talking this has been a really especially an embarrassing week for him so there's it, it was really nuts um so listen uh, we'll go ahead sorry oh no, no 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 go ahead go ahead i was just gonna say because we're, we're we're running down on time and i had a couple of things i wanted to do uh to wrap up the show but i mean we got through most of the of the, the the performances, we got through a lot of just the background information. We did a lot here, and I know you have two more presentations of this tonight. So what I wanted to do was just give you a uh, first of all, thank you again for coming on in such short notice, but give you some chances to uh, to let everybody know exactly where to tune in. I, whenever I listen to you and and Clyde, I'm usually listening on a talk stream live app. Um, uh, I'll, I'll probably be able to, to jump in on that later on tonight after book club concludes for me, but where would you have people go and listen to you as you are live for much of the evening tonight? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. First of all, to have me on your show to discuss this and then for the opportunity to explain, uh, my answer to that question. So tonight at this will be, I'll give Pacific time 7 PM Pacific ground zero radio begins. Uh, that's terrestrial on a few hundred stations. Uh, the best way to find it really simple is go to ground zero dot radio. You can listen to Clyde's show from 7 to 10 p.m. Pacific U.S. time. I will be on 8 to 10 p.m. Pacific uh, ground zero dot radio with Clyde Lewis. Uh, a lot of you can also, as I said, get it terrestrial. Once Clyde shows over 7 to 10, I'm on 8 to 10. Uh, then my show will start immediately on Ground Zero Dot Radio, and that will air for two additional hours. So you have a, a whole five-hour block, four hours of me, five hours if you, with with Clyde, of uh, this analysis tonight. And I know that it's super trendy and popular, and I'm not going to give myself any more credit than I deserve because other people deserve some. I think a lot more credit than I do. Uh, Clyde has been doing this a little bit longer than I did. Um, he started it with Tracy Twyman, who has passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been doing the Super Bowl analysis for over a decade now, and with him for like six, seven years. Um, we were doing this really before it got super duper popular. So I like, I kind of like to say tongue in cheek, but also seriously, that we, we're like the original Super Bowl analysis um, uh, in terms of what we do. So that doesn't mean other people don't do great work. I mean, like this conversation was fantastic tonight with you. You made some really great points. I'm glad that we got the talk, and there's, there is so much more to discuss, so I'm sure there may be a couple of listeners that are like, well, what about this? You missed this 13. I, I, I probably did. Maybe I didn't, but we just didn't have time to mention it. I don't know if you want to take calls, but we can... Uh uh, we can do that now. I would love to do a I would love to do a call and show with you one night. I, I we're going to wrap this one up just in in a couple of seconds here. But I know that when whenever I hear you and and Clyde do your thing on Ground Zero, you usually make time for calls there too. So perhaps some people who wanted to get in tonight are able to uh, really blitz the phones while you guys are on in a couple hours from now and 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 get some get some thoughts uh, in there too. So I. I'll, I'll be definitely sitting by and, and listening, and I, I'm glad, I'm always so uh, enthused to uh, bounce ideas off of you because I've uh, I learned a lot o over the years just from listening, and uh, you've become one of those people that I listen to a lot. So I appreciate you tonight, uh, Ryan Gable. That's going to be it for right now. I have to do a couple of little housekeeping things before I end at nine o'clock and start my book club for tonight. So I will I'll be listening to you later on Ground Zero dot Radio and uh, your link. The secret, the secret teachings info is in the description of this episode. So I hope you get a lot of uh, a lot of traffic there tonight. I really appreciate that. Yeah, on the website you'll find uh, actually if you look at the free archive, I have my last three Super Bowl shows that are all free to download, and then uh, tonight's show will be up there tomorrow morning at the secret teachings info. I'll give you listeners real quick too if you want to write down the phone number to call in tonight. It's going to be five zero three two two five. 0860. It's 503 225 0860. And if you want to contact me directly, uh, rdgable at yahoo.com. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ryan. Have a great show tonight. Thank you. There bye -bye. you go. There's Ryan Gable.